Let's turn to Psalm 26 in our Bibles. The Psalm of David. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me, try my reins in my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with the dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evil doers. I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house, the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, or in the congregations will I bless the Lord. Gracious Father, as we gather today, we're mindful that we are in your presence, and we're here not according to our own will, but you directed us here that we might once again rejoice in your glorious name and rejoice in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone has walked in integrity. And by his faithfulness, we have that acceptance before you and him. And so we publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. So I pray that every aspect of our worship would be to his honor and glory alone. And we're mindful to give you the praise, honor, and glory in his dear name. Amen. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, sing this hymn to the tune of O oh, Worship the King. We gather this day to honor the King who sits on his throne, his triumphs we sing. The Savior who died to redeem from our sin came forth from the tomb and he liveth again. Christ Jesus our Lord, the battle has won. He died and arose, the work is all done. He took on himself all our debt to repay. The sins of his people are all washed away. To Jesus our Lord, all honors we bring and say unto them, Oh, where is thy sting? Enthroned in his glory, almighty to save, he, Jesus, has triumphed for sin and the grave. He rose from the tomb and reigns high above. All praise to his name, all power and love. A righteous in Jesus, we someday will rise to dwell with our Savior upon earth and skies. Good morning. Please turn with me to Jude chapter 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you 
that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept un, in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put to you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these spark evil of those things which they know not, of what they know of naturally as brute beast, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for reward, tarnished in the green saying of Cori. These are spots in your flesh, a feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of tree of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom reserve the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these saying. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to read your word, dear Lord. And we earnestly pray, dear Lord, that you would grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, dear Lord. It is totally in thy hands, in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. During that scripture read, how thankful I am for the grace of God and teaching us. This. That's what we are by nature. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 172. And we'll stand and sing this, O Word of God Incarnate. 172. Oh, we 
wisdom from on high. O oh, truth unchanged, unchanging, O oh, light of our dark sky, we praise thee for the radiance that from the hollow page a lantern to our footsteps shines on from page to page. The church from her dear master received the gift divine. And still that light she lifted for all the earth to shine. It is the golden casket where gems of truth are stored. It is the heaven-brought picture of Christ's our living word. It floated like a banner before God's host unfurled. It shineth like a beacon above a darkly world. It is a chart and compass that o'er life's surging sea. mists and rocks and quicksand still guides on Christ to be. Oh, make thy church, dear Savior, a land of purest gold, to bear before the nations thy true light as a bold. Oh, teach thy wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace, Till clouds and darkness end, they see the face to face. Thank you. you. May be seated. Let's turn in our Bibles once again to Acts chapter 14. A text from verse 19 down to verse 28. And I want to speak with you about continuing in the faith. In scripture, you see faith, or the faith, for Christ, because he is the object of faith. Don't think of your personal belief. You have to say, oh, I'm going to continue in my personal belief. That would be like a drowning man hanging on to himself, and thinking, I'm just going to keep believing that somehow I'm going to be all right as he goes down for the third time. Faith has an object. Faith did not die on the cross. Christ did. Faith did not sacrifice itself. Faith did not work out salvation. Christ did. But faith is that persuasion given to otherwise guilty, dead sinners that Christ alone is their salvation. He's been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Faith does not look to itself, but to Christ alone. And so where God has granted that faith, that persuasion, there is that looking to Christ, and not just a sometime looking, but ever looking, where the writer to the Hebrews says he's the author and finisher, the consummation, of our faith, the beginning and the end. And those that the Lord has saved, he keeps in that faith. It's not like you hear people say, well, keep the faith, brother. No, it's the object of our faith that keeps any for whom Christ has paid that debt. And we see that here in this particular text as Paul and Barnabas are being persecuted wherever he went preaching of Christ being crucified, there was opposition. You know how you can tell that a preacher is declaring the truth as it is in Christ? As, as he, more he exalts him, the more people get upset. Now you can offend, there's preachers that offend on different manners and 
other things, but when it comes down to the message of Christ and Him crucified, we can expect the same opposition today. Maybe not as outward as what we're seeing here. I've never been stoned to death, but I have been chased around for declaring this message that gives Christ all the glory. And so that's what we find here. The Lord had said that to his disciples, that in the world you shall have tribulation. If you don't identify with the Christ of Scripture and point sinners to him alone as salvation without getting people mad until the Lord is pleased to do his work of grace. So here in Acts chapter 14, we continue the story. The last part we looked at was where these folk thought of Paul and Barnabas as being gods and would have sacrificed sacrifices unto them as if they were somebody. And the Lord used this message of Paul there in Lystra. These are different places over there in what would be known today as Turkey to turn hearts to Christ. But verse 19 says, There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, this would be a different Antioch from which Paul and Barnabas were set out in Syria, where they were first called Christians. This would be on the map further north up there in what we know as Turkey today. But there were certain Jews. Notice who it is that's following them to pursue them. These are self-righteous religious folk. You go out here on the street and pull in somebody and say, I'd like to sit down and talk to you about how salvation's completely of God from beginning to end. He did the choosing. He's done the saving through the blood of Christ, and he does the calling. You're probably not going to get a fight. You might get somebody scratching their head thinking, you know, what, what's that all about? But you go into most congregations today and lay out the gospel, just like we're seeing here, that from the scriptures, they're teaching and preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood and righteousness alone is that righteousness, the only righteousness that God accepts. You're going to get some people mad because they've invested their lifetime in believing that somehow their will had something to do with their salvation or their works now either contributing to it or maintaining it. And to tell them as the scriptures declare that none of that's but filthy rags before God. You're going to get a fight. And that's what these Jews did pursuing Paul and Barnabas. They hated the message of Christ and him crucified, that that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the fulfillment of those Old Testament scriptures. And it says when they got there, verse 19, they persuaded the people and how angry were they, but that they took and stoned Paul. And for them, they were thinking that they were doing God a service in stoning him because that's how you dealt with blasphemers under the law. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ told the disciples that, John 16, that when they have put you to death, they will have thought to have done God a service. Such was the hatred that was in their hearts for this Christ, I had Paul come and preached a mixed message, just like we read about in Galatians, where they wanted him, some of these were looking for compromise. Well, you can preach Christ, you can preach his death, but just at least preach circumcision is necessary for salvation. Just one little thing out of the law, that's all we're asking. You can be one of us, we can get along. Paul said if he so much as preached circumcision, out of that whole law, just hold on to circumcision, he said, you've fallen from grace. That's not how it is. It's either Christ or it's nothing. He either finished the work or he didn't. Salvation's by his blood and righteousness alone, or there's no salvation. And so this isn't just a matter of them being so angry like they did with Stephen. They ran upon him and gnashed him with their teeth. That's anger. But it's not just anger, but they, when they stoned Stephen, they thought they were doing God a service. And isn't it interesting that the one man who was there overseeing that stoning at that time 
was none other than this same Paul. Who now they came upon him and stoned him. And it says, drew him out of the city. This is a picture of literally dragging an unconscious body. And some argue, well, was he dead or wasn't he? There are some that believe that it would have been at this particular time that Paul wrote of this experience over there in Galatians, where he said that, that he was taken up into a third heaven. And whether he was, he knew not. But he just knew that when he came back to life, or because there says they left him for dead, supposing that he had been dead, that the Lord, even in that experience, had sustained Paul and shown him things concerning glory. I liken it much to Stephen, who, as they were stoning him, looked up in the glory, and there was Christ standing. And the Lord took him, never to come back. His testimony was silenced at that point. But here was one that the Lord still had more for him to do in the declaration of Christ. And this is where I say that we are immortal till such time as the Lord is pleased to take us. And the Lord brought him back. Now, most people today would go around preaching about their 90 minutes in heaven and what they saw. And there was mama and papa and granddad and all the family that certainly will not be broken. Paul said he saw things of which it was not even permitted for him to speak. Such was the glory of it. I liken that to John, one of the disciples, that when he saw Christ, he fell, as it were, as dead at his feet. See, heaven today is not as men are describing it, where everybody's up there, the band's playing. And if you're a golfer, you got a perfect perfect greens, you're golfing away, and if you're a singer, you 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 got the perfect voice now, and all this stuff. That's not it. We're talking about the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here we see in verse 20, how be it as the disciples stood around about him. <laughs> you can imagine their surprise. Here was the man who had just been preaching Christ to them, and he's laying there as dead. And suddenly the Lord strengthens him, and he rose up. I don't have any problems at all believing that he was dead and the Lord raised him up, just like when Lazarus brought Lazarus back. You realize that when Lazarus was brought back to life, nothing the religious folk hated more than the fact that now they not only had to deal with Christ, but, but Lazarus. In fact, that, that's, it says that they, they came to seek to kill both Christ and Lazarus. And this wasn't the end of the story for Paul. Having been raised up, it was to continue to preach this gospel of Christ and to ultimately face the persecution of death whereby he was decapitated under Roman law. And who was it that delivered him up but these same religious Jews that detested his message of Christ, the same ones that delivered up our Lord Jesus Christ. According to God's determining, they he was delivered into wicked hands and crucified and slain. You don't identify with this Christ without the hatred and the opposition of dead sinners, religious dead sinners. But as, they, as the disciples stood around about him, that means that they had drug him out and left him and they went their way. Can you imagine the surprise of these to find out that he's, he's back? You're not going to take one of the Lords until the Lord determines it. It says he rose up and came back into the city. It wasn't because he was delusional uh, that they said, oh, no, Paul, you don't want to go back into that city. No, he, he went back into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. I don't know exactly how he spent his time back in the city, but I can tell from the following that he was there confirming the souls of those that the Lord had taught of himself. He was there for their encouragement. Because it says there in verse 20, the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, no, it's not far. None of these places are, are far from the other. 
it says that he preached the gospel of that city and had taught many. They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium. Isn't that just where he was? And to Antioch. Isn't that where he was just stoned? Most would look at that and think, Paul, are you out of your ever living mind to go right back into the den of the lions? Well, who preserved Daniel? It was the Lord. It was the Spirit of the Lord directing him to go right back in. For this reason, he wasn't trying to prove himself stronger than these opponents. But it says in verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples. It's not a matter of just preaching Christ to them, but that they, through God's keeping of Paul in Christ, seeing him, that example of how it is God keeps his own, confirming the souls and exhorting them. And here's where the title of the message, to continue in the faith. You can put there to continue in Christ. Because where Christ does the saving, he does the keeping. Continue in him. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Well, that's not something that will win friends and influence people. Today, people want to hear a message of easy believism. All you have to do is make your decision for Jesus and all will be well. Well, that's according to man's so-called plan of salvation. But according to scripture, according to the faith, which Bob read there in Jude chapter 1. The faith once delivered unto the saints. The faith that is Christ and him crucified from beginning all the way back there in Adam all the way to the end of the time. Him being the one faith that it would be through much tribulation that these would enter into the kingdom of God. So long as we're in this flesh, so long as we are identified with this gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. We can expect not just tribulation, but much tribulation. In other words, even as they opposed the Lord Jesus Christ and hated him without cause. So they will hate any today that the Lord has caused to identify with him and his gospel. He's, got, he's divided families. He's dividing associations and such as how God has determined it. And it says then when they had ordained them elders in every church and every assembly of called out ones and had prayed with fasting. In other words, such was their diligence as to the work of the Lord that food was not a priority. Here, more important even than eating, was seeking the Lord's direction for these that they would soon be leaving and yet trusting that they be in the Lord's, that he would keep them. See, we many times think that if I'm not there, I'm not doing the preaching or I'm not doing the keeping, then somehow this is all going to go to naught. It's not in the Lord's word. It says they commended them to the Lord. They didn't go around starting baptismal classes and catechism classes, and we got to get these shored up. It's just like Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. When the Lord had drawn his heart to Christ and he was baptized, Philip never saw him again. He headed on his way. Well, who was doing the, the so called follow up? I remember back in my days, you know, you had that. You had to get them saved, and then you had to have somebody follow up. Discipleship meant, okay, you, you it's a mentorship. you got to stay with this one until they're steady on their feet, and once they are, then you go get another one. That's the way we were taught, but that's not how God does his work. They commended them to the Lord. Who is it that does the saving? It's the Lord. Who is, who is it that does the keeping? It's the Lord. On whom they believed. And after they passed throughout Isidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Adaliah, and thence sailed to Antioch. They had done the great circle route, and now headed back to where they had been sent. 
and from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and gathered the church together, here again, it's not a building, the church is those called out ones for whom Christ paid the debt. It says they rehearsed not all that they had done, but they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door, there it is again, of faith, that is of Christ unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. So looking at this title, the subject of this message, what is it to continue in the faith? Well, the first thing that we've seen here is that it is to continue in the faith despite all persecution and opposition. And the Lord purposes these things. I'll tell you this, that where a man makes a profession of faith and is not truly the Lord's, they'll not long endure. I've had different ones tell me, well, I see what you're preaching and I once believed it and embraced it, but then the opposition became so strong in my family, I had to make a decision. I was either going to hold this as a faith in my heart, but compromise and continue to go where they worship so that there wouldn't be such antagonism. Well, I will tell you that somebody that reasons that way has never been taught of Christ. You can't hold the faith in secret or in private and somehow think that that's a personal faith and I'm not going to disturb the waters. Now, this, this persecution that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas endured as preachers of Christ and his gospel is something that we all can expect. I believe this is that fiery trial which the Lord brings and burns up the wood, hay, and stubble. And I don't know as anybody can face such opposition as to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ as he is in Scripture. I know that by experience. Before it pleased God to reveal Christ in me, I was a pretty likable fellow. Everybody looked at me like an upcoming, rising preacher. And all throughout this country, the Weimar name meant something. And when it became known that something's happened to Ken, he's lost his mind, that now what he's preaching is not in any way what he grew up being taught, there was a problem. And as you go along, people continue to ostracize you. And some approach you. They try to reason with you. They think that somehow we can work this out. But I'll tell you, where Christ has not been revealed in the hearts of other people, to where they can identify with the testimony of the grace of God in your own heart, there's always going to be a spiritual separation that you cannot overcome, nor do you try to overcome. It's just the difference between light and dark. And again, as I've often said, it wasn't Abel that hated Cain. It was Cain that hated Abel. I don't hate my family members or purposely go out of my way to offend them, but I cannot deny the Lord who's bought me. And the spirit of Christ being that persuasion within me, I pray for his grace to speak graciously, that our conversation be with grace, seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt means you don't, like we used to do to, to fool someone and get a man, just take the whole salt shaker and dump the whole thing in there while they're not looking. And they take their first bite or they think it's sugar and it's salt and boy, they get mad. That's not how we're preaching Christ, who is the grace of God. He's the salt of the earth by which that grace is labored. But even with all of that, 
There's going to be opposition. There's going to be separation. I tell people all the time that my true family are these like yourselves, that the Lord has been pleased to teach of his grace in Christ, more so than my physical, earthly family members. I've had uncles and aunts that have passed from this world and I've never displaced from here to go up to their funerals. Some feel that that's important. Well, you got to keep the tie. No, they died in that hatred. There's a reason there's a separation. There's a reason why there's no more communication. It's over this gospel of Christ. And yet through that, when God has been pleased to give that faith, there's a strengthening of that faith. It doesn't turn you away from the faith. If anything can ever turn you away from the faith or Christ as he's revealed here in scripture, that means that there never was faith because faith as described here gives that ongoing determination to look to Christ and him alone. Where else is there hope? Where else is salvation other than in his person and his work? And so we continue the faith, not only through persecution, but as I described the definition of the word faith, through persuasion. Remember what Paul said? I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Against what day? Against the day of judgment. It's not like some have said to me, well, it sounds like you've got all your eggs in one basket. Well, guess what? Salvation isn't a basket of eggs. That's breakable. You drop it, it's broken, and now you got a mess. No, salvation is a persuasion. This is a matter of having been put on the rock, Christ Jesus. And uh, on that rock, I shall not be moved. That's what drove Paul and Barnabas throughout this whole experience. Even in the face of death, having been persecuted and left for dead, this persecution being brought against them, yet it never changed their persuasion. Just as here in verse 22, where they went back around to all of these places from which they had been chased out. So I look at that, men think they own these places. They think this is their territory, but whose is it? It's God's. Think about that, living in this world. Whose world is it? It's God's. It's not for men to determine our direction or our destination. It's God. I'll tell you, when God gives you that persuasion that our life is not in the hands of men, but in the hands of Christ himself, who is the resurrection of the life, therefore we will not fear what men shall do unto us. There's that persuasion. But to continue in verse 22, to exhort them to continue in the faith, they themselves are the example of what it is to continue in the faith. They didn't go back there fear and trembling, and think, okay, we've got to work something out here because this persecution is getting a little bit much. They're preaching and confirming the souls of, of these who are the Lord's out of that grace that had been given to them whereby they are persuaded of these things. And you read Hebrews chapter 11, every one of those instances of faith, of those being in Christ, even though he had not yet come and fulfilled the promises, yet they all died in the faith. They died believing, looking to, persuaded that when he would come, he would pay their sin debt and God would declare them righteous based upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, when it's a persuasion, nobody can turn you from it. That's what it is to continue in the faith. Sometimes someone will ask you, let's go out and eat. What do you prefer? Well, I prefer steak and potatoes or I prefer veggies. That's a preference. A persuasion would be I, I can't partake of anything or eat of anything or do anything other than it be to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That's a persuasion. You cannot talk a, a sinner out of that persuasion. There are many people that will tell you, I prefer to be over here sitting under your preaching because I, I really get encouraged by hearing Christ preach the way you do. But when someone says prefer, you just, you just hold on, wait, here comes the but. But I've got family. How on earth are you going to be 
by your example, testifying to the grace of God and the persuasion that there is no other hope that then when you're with them, you go right along with them. Well, that's just one time. I'm going to go over here and bow the knee to Baal. And then I'm going to come back over here and continue to worship Christ as nice as he was. I, I'm hoping that by my example, being kind and nice to him, that somehow they eventually see it. You realize how false that is? We don't confirm others in following after them. We don't go on their turf. We don't find Paul after this stoning going back in the cities and trying to get these religious leaders together and saying, let's, let's have a conference and let's see if we can't work this out. No. When he went back in, it was for one purpose, and that was to encourage those that were the Lord's, being persuaded. See, that's that persuasion of God in Christ that there is no other way than in him. And so continuing the faith, we can expect persecution, and it's going to be through the persuasion that the Spirit of God gives. But thirdly, it's going to be by the grace of God. Everything that we're studying and looking at here, you might shake your head and say, well, how could he do that? How could this have been the case? Well, through the grace of God. It says there in verse 21, says, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, when it says taught many, it doesn't mean they went on to other subjects. No, it was the gospel. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. And again, there are many that don't have this persuasion. They read it, and I've had preachers tell me that. Well, you're an evangelist, but people need to have teachers too, as if being an evangelist is different from being a teacher. There is no other message. If you don't learn the power of the cross through the preaching and exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to learn anything that's going to be pertaining to your salvation. It's by the grace of God. And that's what we see there, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And then when they got back to Antioch in verse 26, notice what it says, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God. You see that word grace, it always means unmerited favor in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way that God ever shows favor to sinners. And so their message in departing was preaching the grace of God. Their message in returning was the grace of God without any mixture of man's works. Whether that has to do with knowing God in wisdom that has to do with being justified before God. It's through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, by grace, by grace you're saved. Whether it has to do with sanctification. Here's where people depart off of the message of grace and think, well, there's certain parts of our salvation for which God takes charge, and there are other parts whereby we have to be responsible. So they move from preaching the unique obedience of Christ for justification to somehow man over here now having to provide some personal obedience. Now it's all by the grace of God. And that's the only true work of evangelism or teaching or preaching or pastoring or whatever you want to call it is the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And I know again, there's people that say, well, you, if all you do is preach the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have people just living like the devil. Well, have you checked your heart lately? This heart is no different than the devil. We'd all be devils were it not for the grace of God keeping us. So this continuing the faith is still the work of grace. So if you say, what part of no don't you understand? What part of grace don't you understand? You can't add anything to it. Try taking water and oil and putting it in the same bottle. You can shake that all you want to, set it down and put it on the table. There's going to be a separation. That's the way it is. You cannot mix grace and works. And for any to say that preaching the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ is not sufficient 
that somehow we've got to go beyond that and teach other things whereby those that profess the Lord can be strengthened. That's like putting poison in the water and saying, oh, it's just a little bit of poison. It's deadly. It's deadly. But that's how we continue in the grace of God or in this faith. It's through the grace of God. And it's through much tribulation. I know this, that those that the Lord has taught by his grace and called by his grace, it's because he chose them by his grace. And it's the grace of God and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that bloodshed that satisfied God's law and righteousness, that when he is revealed in the heart, there's no turning of that sinner from him. When all had departed from our Lord there in John 6, and the Lord turned to the disciples and said, will you also go away? He said, to whom shall we go? Thou art the one who has the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? But also, I believe that we continue in the faith through those leaders and through others that the Lord has established and put over his own here in verse 23 of my text, Acts 14, when they had ordained them elders. It's not that they were commending them to these men, because we already saw where they commended them to the Lord there in, in verse 23. And yet the Lord has purposed that there be under shepherds who are taught by the same grace of God. And there were some among these that the Lord gave discernment to that they might remain and continue to nourish those that the Lord had drawn to himself. But you can see there in verse 23, we're under the tutelage, if you will, of these that the Lord has taught. It's not just anybody, but it's those who have been taught and persuaded of the same grace, who the Lord raises up to continue to point these of these congregations to him on whom they believed. Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. It's not in the sense of preachers we've heard say, well, you better be following me because I'm the Lord's. No, we follow them as they follow the Lord. And I'll tell you, we're in some appoint themselves as leaders of the people. And yet they're not directing their hearers to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the time to run. Run for your life. Because those that the Lord raises up, such as these here that were appointed and ordained, it's going to be to continue to commend them to the Lord. So thank God for different preachers that the Lord has risen up by which his sheep are being nourished. And we cherish them, not because we want to elevate them above measure, but these are they which the Lord has given us for this time. That will be our teachers and continue to direct us to Christ. And then the final thing I would point out here in this text concerning what it is to continue the faith is the fellowship of believers. How is it that when we come together, yes, we come to hear of Christ and worship him, but the fellowship of the saints, the fellowship, those whom God has given this same faith to believe, to look to Christ, we encourage one another while it is day. That's what I see here when Paul and Barnabas returned back to Antioch, whereby they had been commended to the grace of God. There was a fellowship there. They didn't go back just to give a report as if they were under the authority of any of these. But when they were come, it says, and they gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith of Christ on the Gentiles. And it says there they abode long time with the disciples. They stayed there a long time. It wasn't like being sent out on a mission as missionaries and now that they're back, okay, where are we going to send them next? In time, the Lord did send Paul and Barnabas back out again. People divided up into what they call three different missionary journeys. You'll never find the word missionary 
in Scripture. That's going on a mission. That, that comes from Catholicism, where they sent out their priests and others to establish actual mission stations. And it's interesting that that's how these are described overseas, where you've got organizations sending out missionaries, and you get to those places, and here are these mission stations with walls around them. So they can dictate who comes in and who goes out. That's not how the scripture describes these trips. I call them gospel preaching trips, whereby Paul was sent out and came back to home base, if you will, because that's where their fellowship was. And what a fellowship it is. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples, verse 28. Don't sheep gather together? And isn't that an encouragement? Whereby we know that we're not alone. We might not be many, but we're not alone. Where Christ has been pleased to call any of us to himself, we desire one another's fellowship. And therein we're also strengthened in that faith, to continue in that faith. I know sometimes it seems like we're alone and we're isolated, but the Lord has his sheep. And just like Paul and Barnabas, they didn't have a map as to where the Lord was directing them. They were continually looking to the Lord, His Spirit, to direct them. But I know this, God never sends any of His preachers out on fool's errands. There's no dead-end streets. Wherever God directs His Word, it must be. I like to think of it in those terms. There may be one sheep. It may not be many. It may be one sheep that the Lord has redeemed and through the declaration of Christ would be pleased to draw to himself. Well, I hope that's an encouragement to us. It has been for me, even in rehearsing, thinking back even over my lifetime, even up to now, of the great work of God in my life, being persuaded of these things and associating with others to whom the Lord has given that same persuasion that we continue in that faith. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 46. When it says, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, don't think of a physical tongue. I'm not sure anybody can talk too well with a thousand tongues, but it's being of languages. It's a reminder that God's sheep are everywhere. And wherever he directs it, he's going to communicate it in that tongue, in that language, and bring that word home to heart of his redeemed ones. Let's stand and sing this, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth upon the honors of Thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood does make the foulest clean, His blood avails for me. Hear Him, ye there, His praise ye dumb, Your loosened tongues employ. He might behold your Savior come, And lead ye lame for joy. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. Amen. All right. We will see you next time. Lord willing.